Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Empty Cloud Monastery. Uh, so this evening uh, we have with us Bhante Sumitta, so our beloved Mahatera from Sri Lanka, uh, and my name is Bhante Sudaso, uh, our less beloved, not <laughs> Mahatera from the United States. Um, so we'll, what's that? Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, less so. But uh, still, I'll take it. Uh, so this evening, we'll be talking a bit about one of the ancient traditional practices that Buddhist monks have been doing since the time of the Buddha, uh, which uh, in common parlance, in, at least in Western Buddhism, it's most commonly known by the Thai name uh, Tudong, uh, which itself is derived from the Pali word Dutanga. Uh, so before we get started, we can start by paying homage to the Buddha, uh, and then we'll begin our, our discussion. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang tamang sanghang namasami. So as mentioned, we'll be talking today a bit about the, the practice of wandering. Uh, so the monastic practice of wandering from uh, town to town uh, with um, a bare minimum of possessions, uh, not carrying food, not carrying money, uh, and uh, just relying upon the spontaneous generosity of others. So as mentioned in, in uh, modern Thai Buddhism and also in most of the Western Buddhist world, this is known by the name Tudong, uh, which is from the Pali word Dutanga, which means uh, ascetic practice. Uh, but in the suttas, it's more commonly called Charika, uh, which uh, actually has the more general meaning of, of traveling or wandering or a journey. Uh, and is the uh, again, it was the, the standard practice at the time of the Buddha. So the Buddha himself spent much of his time wandering, uh, walking from place to place, uh, living on, on alms round, uh, sleeping in the forest at night. Uh, so living a very simple life. Uh, and also uh, most of his disciples similarly practiced in that way. Uh, and this is a practice which is um, still done to this day throughout the Buddhist world. Um, and uh, again, it's particularly common in Thailand, but also in other Buddhist countries, it's a practice which is still done from time to time. Uh, so maybe we could start with Bhante Sumitta, if you'd like to talk a little bit about what we know from the suttas, what was done at the time of the Buddha in terms of, of monks wandering around. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah. I think when the Buddha addressed the first uh missionary group of 60 monks, 60 arahantas in the world, um, the five disciples and the uh, 54 friends of uh, Yasa, and then uh, also Buddha himself. So there were altogether 61. And Buddha addressed them, Charata Bhikkave Charikam Bahujana Hitaya Bahujana Sikhaya Atthaya, Hitaya, Sukhaya, Deva Manusana, Ma Ekena, Dve Agamitta. So here the Buddha had, uh, this is the first uh, advice by the Buddha to uh, the 60 group of monks. He said, Charata Bhikkave Charikam, monks, wonderful, go forth. Bahujana Hitaya, Bahujana Sukhaya, for the well being and happiness of the many. And uh, this includes uh, not only humans, but also devas. Bahujana hitaya, bahujana sukhaya, atthaya hitaya, sukhaya, deva manusana. And then uh, he said, ma ekena dve agamita. When you walk, uh, don't two monks walk the same path. 
uh, you take two uh, paths so that you can reach out to as many as you can. So that was the idea to help out the many uh, uh, folks who are in need of Dhamma, who are in need of help uh, to rescue themselves from the samsaric uh, suffering. So ever since Buddha also uh, started walking, although the, all those uh, Arahant monks, they could easily airborne, they could fly, uh, but they would uh, always walk. They, this walking uh, itself is an amazing practice. Um, when you walk, uh, every step you um, go forward is uh, full of compassion and uh, loving kindness for the well-being and happiness of the other sentient beings. So you encounter so many. And uh, also it's good for your own health. And you see the world, you see um, many things. Um, the benefits are actually immense. So uh, Buddha has been walking from Buddha Gaya where he was enlightened and then to he went to for his first teaching to Sarnath uh, Deer Park, Nigadaya. And that's quite a quite a long distance. Even today by car or something, it takes a long time. So Buddha almost um, uh, always walk um, for uh, the benefit of the others. It's a very simple when you walk, of course, um, when you don't use any other uh, horse carriages or any other um, uh, ways of walking, mode of transportation, you also have to walk uh, simple, light. So travel light. Uh, can also be helpful. So they had uh, the ball, uh, the the single layer, the double layer robes, and then other simple requisites: um, water filter uh, with another cloth, and yeah, very simple requisites uh, were there uh, for them to survive. Especially the ball was very helpful uh, for arms round and also drinking water and some other uh, purposes. And they had the needle and the thread uh, just in case they need to mend their robes. Uh, those are the, the things that they did and they kept uh, meeting people. When a monk walks, uh, he is very easily highlighted. People can see them uh, from far distance because of that uh, maybe different color, different weird robe <laughs> in a day. So even now, if you walk, like people look at us like weird uh, <laughs> uh, strangers, like uh, aliens. <laughs> so that's a way also to, you know, you get attracted somehow, <laughs> like a goldfish in the fishbowl. <laughs> um, yeah, so you are highlighted and then when a lot of people look at you, thousands of look at you, you also have to be careful. I can't just run here and there, looking here and there. You had to have a lot of sealer. You had to have a lot of vinaya. Uh, these are also very important. So the monks would walk uh, very um, compassionately and also with a lot of uh, sadha and restraint uh, in themselves. The way they walk can also inspire so many. And one of the best examples uh, is how um, Emperor Ashoka was inspired by looking at just a small young uh, Samanera monk uh, who was just uh, seven years old, Nikro the Samanera. He saw him walking with so much peace and serenity within him and he completely uh, changed his course of life. And the man who was called the Chanda Ashoka, the violent Ashoka, uh, transformed himself uh, to become a Dhamma Ashoka, um, the, the righteous um, Ashoka, a man who brought a lot of fear and sadness to others became Ashoka, and the man who brought peace and happiness to others. So, yeah, so when we walk, we can uh, inspire many thousands. 
uh, even without saying a single word, uh, people can uh, get themselves inspired. Thank you, Bhante. And so, uh, again, this is a practice which was very common in the time of the Buddha. So it was very common for monks to, uh, to own very few things uh, and to uh, easily be able to collect the few things they had and, and to set out wandering. Uh, and uh, it was common for monks to wander for eight or nine months of the year uh, and only to stay in one place during the rainy season, during the Vasa season. Uh, so these days it's uh, more common for monks to spend long periods of time living in one place. Uh, but there's still many monks who, who take on the practice of wandering. Uh, so wandering from place to place, um, often again going on foot. Uh, when we go on foot, we make ourselves available for others. Uh, so it's good to keep in mind that first and foremost, the practice of Tudong is a practice of compassion. Uh, it's a practice of making ourselves visible. Uh, the Buddha spoke about four mm, divine messengers, four deva dutta. Uh, so the fourth messenger is the the wandering monk. Uh, so the the first three messengers are uh, a sick person, an old person, a dead body. So these are three things which uh, give us a sense of the, the dangers of samsara, the dangers of not being enlightened, the dangers of not living a spiritual life. Uh, and the fourth messenger is the sign of, of hope, uh, the sign of spiritual practice, which leads to wisdom, uh, to peace of mind, uh, which leads to true understanding, which leads to serenity of heart, safety of heart. So uh, by walking uh, through the world, even if one doesn't say anything at all, uh, just by walking through the world, a monk is, is reminding other people of, of this fourth messenger. Uh, just by, by one's own appearance in public, one is reminding people that it's possible to live a peaceful life, a wise life, uh, a life which is dedicated to spiritual self-improvement. Um, so that itself can be really transformative. Uh, just the the sight of a monk walking walking past can deeply alter the course of a person's life, as as Bhante Sumita just mentioned with um, the historical King Asoka in the time uh, of ancient India. Uh, and uh, Tudong practice is it's also uh, a practice of contentment. Uh, it's a practice of equanimity. Uh, it's a practice of renunciation. Uh, so in order to walk long distances, uh, one can only carry very, very few things. Uh, so you can't bring all your fancy possessions with you. Uh, in fact, there's this kind of a stereotype of uh, somewhere around day three, Tudong monks throw away half their stuff um, because they realize they brought way too much with them. Um, so it's, it's always recommended to carry an absolute bare minimum, uh, which means letting go. Uh, so you're probably not going to bring your computer when you go to Dong because that's just too heavy. Uh, you're definitely not going to bring your big, soft, fluffy mattress. I don't even know how you would carry that with you. Um, but instead, um, going with the absolute bare minimum, what do you actually need to survive? Uh, and again, uh, one of the elements of, of this wandering practice is, is not carrying food. Uh, and not bringing money. Uh, so this also represents the fact that we are uh, giving ourselves up entirely to faith in the Buddha. Uh, faith that the system the Buddha created works in every place in the world, in every culture, uh, no matter what religion the local people follow or don't follow, as is often the case these days. Uh, but rather, we're trusting that people will recognize our goodness. Uh, they'll recognize our commitment uh, to goodness, and they'll want to support that. Uh, and it's been my experience that this is the case. No matter what culture one is in, no matter what uh, religion it is, so it doesn't need to be a Buddhist culture, it can be any kind of culture, uh, there's still the spark of goodness in people, of generosity in people. 
uh, which leads them to mm, recognize the value of supporting uh, supporting wandering monks, of giving food to those who, who need it, and giving food in particular to religious practitioners, uh, to monastic uh, contemplatives. Uh, of course, you don't always get exactly the food you want, uh, but that's part of the practice of contentment and renunciation. That's being content with any kind of food, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's what you want or, or not, whether it's what you like or not. Uh, it's beside the point. What's important is, is it is it enough? Uh, and uh, so one of the reasons that we're, we're talking about this particular topic is because, uh, as mentioned, this is something which is still done to this day. Uh, and in fact, in in a few weeks, uh, Bhante Samitha, uh, myself, and Aya Soma, who is um, currently invisible, so she she would be here, but <laughs> she's not. Um, she's actually making preparations for our wandering practice in Italy. Um, so the three of us, together with two Thai monks, uh, will be wandering through Italy uh, for a few weeks. Um, so sharing Dhamma in various places um, and also spending a lot of time just walking, walking around, walking from place to place, uh, living on the, the generosity of others uh, and uh, using the opportunity to bring this ancient practice forward. Uh, so uh, I just put in the... the comments window if you if you'd like to see a link to um, a brief summary of some of the things that we'll be doing in Italy um, because another um, aspect of Tudong practice is that it's uh, it's something which is not just for monks but it's something which lay people can participate in as well uh, so it's something which brings blessings to anybody who wants to have some involvement in it uh, so Commonly, uh, lay people will come and walk with the monks for shorter periods of time or longer periods of time, uh, sometimes a few hours or a few days, uh, coming and, and walking with the monks and, and doing the similar practice. Uh, this practice of, of simplicity, of contentment, of uh, wandering from place to place with a bare minimum of possessions and demonstrating to the world that it's possible to live a spiritual life. Uh, that it's possible to to live a simple and peaceful life dedicated to wisdom. Uh, and another uh, important point uh, mm, about the practice of Tudong uh, So often what we're doing is we're facing uh, hardship and difficulty. Uh, so physical pain, if you're not used to walking a lot, you might have a lot of physical pain. I see Bhante Sumitha nodding. Um, uh, you might have to deal with heat or cold. Uh, again, it's hard to bring a bunch of sweatshirts and jackets with you um, when you're traveling light. Uh, so you might be too hot during the day and too cold at night. Uh, you might have to walk through rain. Uh, and you can carry an umbrella if you like, but one, that's more weight. Um, and two, umbrellas are not perfect. Uh, if you're walking through a, a, a downpour, you're still going to get wet one way or the other. Uh, so it's learning how to face hardship, learning how to face physical discomfort uh, and how to maintain equanimity and peace of mind when faced with those kinds of conditions. Uh, so maybe Bhante, would you like to talk a bit about that? Or pick up the thread? Yes, I think, um... I was involved uh, in uh, Tudong from New York to Washington, D.C., and also in Florida. Uh, it was heavy downpours in uh, Florida. So I remember, like, we were walking. Uh, we, uh, the rain was shooting. <laughs> uh, so we had to wear the uh, raincoats. Uh, and, yeah, and sometimes it's so windy, sometimes it's so hot and sometimes raining i never we never stopped walking uh, morning sunrise to evening sunset we kept walking like 25 to 30 miles per day i think it is really fast walking too and um, 
yeah it was really amazing uh, especially when we were walking from new york to washington dc uh, on the way there were so many different uh, different cities different localities different cultures and also we had so many different experiences um, on the way we saw like dead animals and uh, birds dying and uh, you know by the right side of the road and some places were very beautiful and nice uh, weather and sometimes uh, uh, all those were actually also inspiring it and people were um, also happy to see us and you know the monks they when they saw us I remember some of the people they they touched their hearts to see the monks and some of them um, they were honking their cars some of them uh, stopped the cars in the middle of the road and came ran to us took a selfie <laughs> <laughs> so they were so happy to see monks walking and they were all very very beautiful experiences and yeah I think we kept on uh, sending loving kindness to more sentient beings, people, and elderly people, sick people, children, and all the residents, uh, even the animals. When I saw some of those um, animals who were uh, knocked down by the, the traffic, and uh, yeah, we took some time uh, off to send loving kindness to them. Um, those were really beautiful experiences. Yeah, so this is one of the things that happens when we put ourselves out in the world without any filters. As you start to see the parts of the world that we normally are unaware of, that we normally don't see so much. Uh, things which we might have some intellectual idea about, but you don't really see it for yourself. Uh, and one aspect of that is, is in fact death. Uh, the fragility of life. Uh, so it's very easy to take it for granted that we're uh, we're alive. Um, and the Buddha says we tend to be intoxicated with life. Uh, so we become so caught up in the fact that we're alive uh, that we forget about the fact that we're inevitably going to die. Uh, when we're healthy, we become intoxicated with health. Uh, so so fixated on being healthy that we, we forget that health is impermanent. It's unreliable. Uh, our health can fail at any time. Uh, and when we're young, we're intoxicated with our youth. Uh, though that's that's actually maybe one of the easier ones because our youth is fading with every moment. Um, and some of us, it's already faded a bit. And <laughs> I see some laughing in the audience. Uh, so, but when we're young, we tend to be intoxicated with our youth. Uh, so when we... Uh, go out in the world and we wander wander through the world, then you can't escape these things. You can't hide from them. Uh, the truth of, of reality becomes very visible, uh, inescapable. And this can be fuel for wisdom. Uh, when you look around the world, you see impermanence everywhere. When you look around the world, you see aging, decay, sickness, and death. You see it everywhere. Uh, you can't hide from it. Uh, and then that inspires us to look inwards, to look at our own mind uh, and to, to seek um, a higher happiness, to seek the, the true safety that comes through, through wisdom, through awakening. Um, another element of Tudong practice, by the way, which is uh, not to be uh, overlooked, is the power of walking meditation. Uh, so many people find walking meditation quite difficult. Uh, often a complaint that people make is that uh, they don't get any samadhi when they do walking meditation. Well, you might just not be walking long enough. Uh, the first time I really appreciated walking meditation was when I did walking meditation for 90 minutes straight. So for an hour and a half straight. Uh, then I started to really appreciate how walking meditation can be a very powerful way of, of focusing and sharpening the mind. Uh, it's different from sitting meditation, uh, but it has its own particular benefits. And in fact, the Buddha says that one of the benefits of walking meditation is that it produces long-lasting samadhi. Uh, so it allows the mind to become very sharply concentrated for a long period of time. 
So uh, with wandering, uh, one is not letting one's mind wander, uh, but rather one is trying to, to always stay mindful of the body, to always be focused on, on one's walking as a form of walking meditation, uh, clearly feeling one foot after another, uh, clearly feeling the breath coming in and out of the body. Uh, so staying sharply, clearly aware of our own experience. Um, and you can do this all the time, by the way. Uh, so every time you're walking, it can be walking meditation. Uh, so always bringing attention to what we're doing and making it a, a continuous part of training the mind. Uh, and as Bhante Smitha was mentioning, also constantly doing metta, uh, which also is something that you can do. So when you're walking through the city, uh, well, be mindful of your body as you walk, but also constantly produce metta. Uh, so filling your mind with metta as you walk through the city. Uh, so these are practices which uh, can make every moment a meditation practice. Uh, so meditation is not just something that we do for a few minutes once or twice a day, uh, but rather it's something that we try to incorporate and integrate into uh, every part of our life. Do you want to take up? Um, yeah. Would you like to also share something about your trip to Bogota? Ah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, also recently, ISOMA and I were in uh, Colombia. Uh, so we were invited there for a, a conference on, actually particularly on, on Thailand, but the since Buddhism is such a major part of Thai culture, they also had invited a, a group of Buddhist monks to come, including me and ISOMA. Uh, and uh, part of what we did there was, was actually walking around uh, so exposing uh, people in Colombia to the sight of Buddhist monks uh, and also doing alms around in, in Colombia. Uh, so Colombia is not a Buddhist country. And in fact, there's no Buddhist temples in the country, as far as I'm aware. I think there's, there's a couple of meditation centers, but there's no Buddhist temples and there's no Buddhist monks. Uh, so it's very, very rare for people to see Buddhist monks in that country. Uh, and most, uh, many or most of the people there, uh, it might have been the first time they'd ever seen a monk at all. Uh, so, I mean, that experience happens even in the United States where there's many Buddhist temples and many Buddhist monks. Um, still, many people, when they see us, it's the first time they've ever seen a Buddhist monk. Um, but in Colombia, definitely, because there's, again, there's no Buddhist monks living in the country. Uh, and monks very rarely visit. So the experience of, of walking around, uh, again, uh, so many people just delighted at the sight of a Buddhist monk. Uh, many people, of course, want selfies. Um, so sometimes it would be like every 10 steps. So you walk and someone is like, oh, can I have a photo with the monk? And it's like, yes, you can. You walk 10 more steps and oh, I want a photo. You walk 10 more steps. Oh, I want a photo. So it's just continuous. Uh, and if one is prone to irritability, one might be irritated by this. Uh, but instead, uh, instead of being irritated, instead one recognizes that this is actually one of the ways that we bring peace to the world. Uh, so uh, maybe for one person, it's, it's just a novelty to have a picture with a Buddhist monk. But that also means that it's a reminder to them that monks exist in the world. It's a reminder to them that there is another way of living one's life, that life doesn't need to be a, a mindless greed fest. Uh, life doesn't need to be just one string of, of dissatisfied cravings after another, uh, but rather there's another way of living one's life. And you don't necessarily need to become a monk, of course, you can be a lay person and, and live a spiritual life, a peaceful life. Uh, but the sign of a, a monk, the appearance of a monk reminds one that there is a deeper truth to life, that there is a, a more profound way of living. Uh, yeah, so walking through Colombia, again, many, many people coming up and wanting photos or, or asking questions, uh, asking what we were. Uh, again, most of them had never seen a Buddhist monk before. So asking what we were and why we wear these robes, uh, what practices do we do? Um, and all of this gives this uh, gives us the opportunity to talk about the Dhamma. 
so ultimately, uh, Turong practice, uh, one of its main functions is to share the Dhamma. Uh, so the Dhamma is not something that we keep hidden within ourselves, but it's something that we, we share openly with the world, that we display openly to the world. Uh, and wandering practice is a very potent way of, of sharing it with the world. Uh, and similarly, doing alms round in Colombia. Again, Colombia is, is not a Buddhist country, and most people didn't even have any idea what alms round was. Uh, but you see a line of monks with their bowls, and you see somebody put food in the bowl, and people understand immediately. So when we did alms round in, in Bogota, Colombia, we had people flocking to us uh, at the delightful opportunity to give food to Buddhist monks. Uh, this is one of the really magical things about alms round, like people happy at the opportunity to give food to Buddhist monks. Uh, and we're not talking about Buddhist people. We're just talking about ordinary people off the streets, people who maybe didn't know anything at all about Buddhism uh, or what Buddhist monks are. Uh, but they see the practice of alms round and it touches something deep in the heart and they want to participate. Uh, they want to be involved. So I found this a very beautiful example. Uh, and uh, similarly in Italy, this is, uh, I've been to Italy as a monk a couple of times now uh, and had similar experiences of people who uh, maybe they've, they've never met a monk before, but they, uh, they, see, they see us walking and they want to come and ask questions or they want to come and offer food or they want to come and, and practice meditation. Uh, or learn a bit about the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so this is, it's one of the main reasons why we do these practices is as a, a vehicle for sharing the Dhamma with others. Yeah, I, I also remember like when we were um, going for Pindapata here, arms around in a farmer's market in West Raving. That is West Raving, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we just were walking and people were looking at us and um, they were just saying hi and uh, some people, they wanted to come to talk to us and they even invited us to their home sometimes. And they also asked, oh, we know you guys are here. And they also came to the temple. Um, they wanted to practice. And in the Amsterdam, this is one of those things that we find and how we can inspire people uh, when we were we are just walking uh, so people can see us all the traffic people uh, see us and uh, in the the farmer's market we were just walking around um, we just actually don't go for merely for food but i think it's an opportunity for us to bless the people uh, bless those business places bless those children and even the, the people, then when they are taking pets for walk, um, we can see them. We also uh, want to bless them. So we just kept walking around, uh, blessing them all the people in our heart and then standing uh, for an hour or so until uh, we are ready to come back. And this is such a beautiful experience. I felt uh, uh, it's a really good thing as uh, Bhante Sudhaso mentioned. It's not only those Buddhist people, uh, the other people are also so generous. They open their heart, they see the monks with the bowl. And especially I was so touched with the children leading sometimes. They mm. were encouraging their parents. It was really, truly remarkable. They have never seen a monk, <laughs> you know, small children here. And they were leading their parents forcing their parents sometimes, encouraging their parents to offer something to the monks. This I have seen many times in uh, here in uh, farmer's market. And I hope uh, sooner we can start uh, Armstrong over there too. And also particularly uh, uh, when we were walking in uh, New York Union Square, that was amazing. That was truly amazing how we were walking through the busy uh, farmer's market and how people were touched uh, by our presence. We were walking uh, like several rounds around the park, uh, going through the busy uh, farmer's 
uh, market and some of the people they were waiting for us <laughs> uh it was really uh, one time i remember we couldn't go due to some reason one week mm. and they asked why didn't you come last week mm. we were waiting for you <laughs> you know those were really something that we were actually uh, cherishing in our memories and some of the people oh how wonderful so good to see mom i have never seen my four monks together you know those some of the things uh when they said that was our arms that was our pindapata that was our reward so we were always encouraged by our says um i also want to go back again mm. uh to union square pindapata i'm really uh, very happy to see that experience i remember one of the experiences that uh, was um what the sudarsa was mentioning how it is uh, part of our meditation one of the monks he was walking he was walking in an attika sanya so attika sanya is a meditation that you focus on bonds and this monk was um, uh, focusing meditating on skeleton and um, so while he was walking he was still walking and um, keeping that uh, attika sanya um, meditation on um, bonds and while he was walking he saw uh, a young woman coming and she smiled at him and then she passed by and monk uh, didn't pay much attention to that and he just um, walked um, forward and then he saw uh, another man coming and the man asked uh, did you see a woman passing by that was my wife <laughs> and the the monk said uh, i didn't see a woman but i saw a skeleton <laughs> that was really amazing why did he see a skeleton because when uh, she saw the monk she smiled at him and the monk was focusing he he was meditating on a uh, skeleton and he saw the teeth of the woman mm -hmm. and immediately mm -hmm. the whole thing triggered the, in such a way that he could see the entire skeleton this mm -hmm. is the power of meditation see even while walking uh, they could do that yes walking um, is again a meditation uh, it is so much good and actually it is said that that monk became an arahant by um, by uh, seeing that that became a triggering point for him uh, you never know how it happens uh, sometimes while walking sometimes while um, having food or sometimes while sitting i uh, it can happen to you any time um, opening of the dhamma uh, i can happen to you uh, any time so keep walking and keep practicing that will be so much uh, better and also uh, but as sudas also mentioned that we have to walk uh, travel light and in dhamma pada the buddha mentioned in uh, one point um, sapat bharo pakhi sakuno Uh, that means you know the uh, the birds they are just like arahants this like just like enlightened beings um they create nests and they uh, uh, have their own uh, uh, kids and when they grow up uh, they leave the kids and also they leave the nest they would never take them back in another uh, carriage like we humans do right they are so amazing they can let let it go very easily they can let go their children they can let go their home they can renounce very easily and so they just have the uh, the weight of the wings hmm. that's it so sapat bharo pakhi sakuno the arahant person the enlightened person is just like that you don't take anything you just travel light <laughs> so the more you uh, feel light the the faster your uh, journey becomes right if you have so much weight your journey becomes slower you have so much weight so that's another way that we can walk faster walk faster go closer towards the nibbana and for that you need to you need to travel light mm -hmm. and uh, in the paricca samuppada also we were talking about uh, today uh, in the discussion um, so that time we found how we get rid of this um, 
you know, the I making, my, me making, my making, the process start with the dispassion. Dispassion is renouncing, giving up, letting go. That is where we start. So when you uh, start with that, then you can get rid of avijja. Um, this passion is the starting point. You need to um, have that letting go attitude. Um, so that way we can uh, continue our sansaric journey uh, towards the final goal. Yeah, so this attitude of, of traveling light, uh, so that's um, talking not just about our possessions, but about all the, the baggage in the mind. Um, so what are we carrying around with us in our mind? Uh, what kind of attachments or obsessions are we carrying around with us? Uh, what kind of resentment or grudges or stories are we constantly carrying around in the mind? Uh, and noticing how that weighs us down, uh, slows us down. It uh, creates dukkha. Uh, it makes it difficult for us to, uh, to go through day by day. Uh, whereas if one has a, a light mind, uh, then one can one can do anything uh, without being bothered or disturbed. Uh, also, when Bhante, when you were quoting the Dhammapada verse, I also remember there's another one, um, like swans leaving a lake, they oh. leave home after home behind. Do you remember this one? Mm -hmm. I can't remember off the top of my head mm -hmm. where it is. About the... The swans behind are leaving yeah. behind their... Yeah. Um, yeah, like swans leaving behind a lake, they leave behind home after home. Oh, okay. Like, it should be in the Arahanta Vagga, I guess. I think so. Yeah. Um, but it's it's that similar idea that uh, an awakened being has no attachment to any place. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, they might go and live in a monastery for a few days and then they leave it behind without uh, looking back even once. Like there's no thought of uh, disappointment, like, oh, it's too bad I left that place behind. They just they just go on. Uh, similarly, maybe wandering Tudong from place to place, you might find a really nice place to stay the night. Uh, maybe nice quiet forest with a beautiful view, uh, very peaceful. But then the next day you pack up your things and you move on. And you leave that home behind and you keep going. Uh, so this also is training the mind in the constant practice of letting go. Uh, because what are we doing with our mind? With our mind, we're constantly uh, creating a home for ourselves. Uh, so our internal home, our internal home is built up of um, attachments. It's built up of expectations. It's built up of requirements. Uh, actually, you can see this really clearly with, with food. Uh, people thinking like, well, breakfast has to be this way and lunch has to be this way and I need to have snacks at this time and this time and, and there has to be milk in my coffee. And, and it's like, well, okay, yeah, and the more requirements you have, the more suffering you have. Uh, the less requirements you have, the more peace of mind you have. So noticing how we, we build up this, this little safety zone in our mind uh, and also our safety zone of, of ideas and opinions. Uh, so we have our ideas and our opinions, and, and this is what we rely upon. It's what we uh, identify as being me and mine, uh, to the point where we even avoid information, which might challenge our views and opinions. Now, we don't want to hear things which might uh, challenge our opinions about things. Uh, I remember years ago, I was, I was talking to... Uh, one of my siblings about a particular topic uh, and I sent her an article to read um, and she told me she didn't want to read the article because it might change her views uh, so and she was she liked her views and she didn't want them to be challenged uh, so I, I just bring this bring this up as an example of how uh, we can get so attached to our uh, view of the world the way we think about the world that we actually avoid encountering any information which might change our views. Uh, but the practice of, of Buddhism is actually recognizing that our views are almost certainly wrong. Because if we really had right view, we would be fully awakened. 
So we must still have some wrong view because we're not awakened yet. So this means that if we're really practicing Buddhism correctly, we should be uh, delighted for the opportunity to relinquish our views, delighted at the opportunity to learn things which will challenge uh, our perspectives, uh, delighted to hear things which might uh, be opposite to our opinions, because it's through that process of investigation that we get closer to the truth, uh, that we get closer to awakening to the true nature of reality. So this is physically manifested in Tudong practice, where one is constantly leaving behind home after home. Uh, so we make a temporary home and then we leave it behind immediately. Uh, because actually this is what we're doing in every moment. Uh, so we come into this moment uh, and it seems like home, but then we immediately leave it behind and we move on. Uh, so whenever we start to get stuck on something, stuck on an experience that we don't want to change, uh, then we start suffering. Uh, but whenever we have this constant willingness to leave behind the present experience, then there's no problem. Uh, the mind is always peaceful and at ease. Yeah, I think um, sometimes people uh, feel so bored when you are staying in the same place, <laughs> right? Same house, same people, same air. Every time it's so monotonous. <laughs> I think uh, the monks who are traveling have such variety. Every time you have uh, fresh air, every time you meet uh, different people, and you you can be so happy outside. You don't have much to survive. I mean, save. You don't have to worry about, you know, rescuing or uh, safeguarding your house. Or if someone is, um, um, you know, looting your house, or so you don't have to worry about anything. You have nothing. Just the bowl and the robe, no one will, uh, you know, come um, uh, do any damage to you. And uh, I think this country in particular is, uh, it's like, a, it's like 50 countries. <laughs> you can, you can walk, every country is so different, the weather is different, um, uh, the, the climate and also the temperature and uh, the other uh, natural sceneries. Sometimes you see all um, uh, like barren land. Sometimes you see all the mountains. Sometimes you see so beautiful greenery like here in New Jersey. And here we have all the four seasons and um, rains and snow and winds and everything here. And if you go to California, it's a uh, hot but not humid <laughs> so yeah there are many many good things um, we can see uh, it's uh, again a very beautiful experience so when you walk we are also connecting we are also building a community uh, we meet so many beautiful people around and we have an opportunity to share the dhamma and without any uh, negative attachment we can do so much good for ourselves and for the um, for the benefit of the many. Mm -hmm. I think it's also a very good thing. Um, many many number of um, benefits that when we uh, we have when we walk, as uh, Bhante said, we might get uh, little food sometimes, and you still have to walk, and <laughs> you just have food, you know, by the roadside sitting on the lawn, sitting on just sometime, sometime under a tree. Uh, we had many times. I remember one time I was just laying down on the on the road, <laughs> just nothing. It was so comfortable <laughs> because under the sky, um, you were also so tired. You had to, you know, stay, take some rest. Just um, doing that was also very helpful. And sometimes I remember uh, through the cities, we were walking with so many people, and also we were walking many, many, many different uh, localities. And sometimes we walk hours and hours and hours without seeing any people. <laughs> mm. Just, just uh, the nature. Uh, again, it was so amazing. Um, all these are constantly helping us to train ourselves 
to you know uh, adjust ourselves to different circumstances train ourselves meditate ourselves under different circumstances that really makes us uh, better practitioners so i think we've we've covered a lot of ground in uh, talking about the, this wandering practice um, so i think we can go ahead and start wrapping up uh, for this session um, I do want to, uh, again, point out that uh, anyone who wants to come and join in for uh, our activities in Italy, you're welcome to. Uh, so if you want to come and walk with us for a period of time, uh, you can come and join us for a period of time and walk with us. Uh, if you want to join for any of the meditation programs, Dhamma Talks, retreats that we'll be doing in Italy, again, you can, it's all in the, the link that I posted earlier, you can see a little bit about what our plans are and, and how you can come and participate. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, if you have any questions or comments, we could take um, some questions or comments. Uh, so uh, first off, hello to everyone who's joining in so far. So hello to Shimul, Mary, Alpana, Wen, Rahul Owad, Patricia, Robin, Janaki, Karen, Suba, Anonymous, Sud, Jyoti, Ashok, Chen, Monk Life, Smiley, and Bhavani. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, and I see a couple questions. Um, so Anonymous asks, does an arhant to the Buddha experience jhana all the time and remain mindful all the time? That's a little off topic. So I recommend bringing that to monk chat tomorrow evening. So monk chat on Friday evenings is our chance for answering all of the random questions that you might have. Uh, so at the other talks, we, we keep focused to a particular topic, uh, but for the Friday evening monk chat, there's no topic. So anything is acceptable. So Bhavani asks, question. Do unsatisfied ghosts exist? I assume by this you mean petas. Uh, how will Dutanga monks deal with ghosts, snakes, and scorpions? Bhante, mm -hmm. to talk about this? Um, I remember there are many stories about uh, these things in uh, the suttas. Uh, one time a monk was meditating under a, uh, un under a tree in the, by the side of the road. Uh, by the side of the, the river and uh, uh, a peta appears uh, to him and asking for water. The monk said, why do you ask water? There is the whole river just uh, here right in front of you. Why do you ask the water from me? And the, the peta said, um, the, there is uh, the huge flow of water, yes, but when I reach there, the whole entire river becomes fire. Mm. So that was the karma, bad karma that I did. I can't uh, drink water by myself. Please help. So the monks took water uh, by his own bowl and offered to her. That was the first time in many, many years that she, uh, you know, that uh, hundreds and thousands of years, they, they suffer just like that. So they are not satisfied. <laughs> And there are many, many cases like that, how they are suffering there. And um, they would come to monks and asking for help. That's another story. I remember uh, another uh, peta came to a monk, uh, a practitioner monk in the, in the forest. And she said, uh, uh, can you help me? Uh, you, you go to my house and uh, ask to ask my daughter to offer a dana to you <laughs> and I will uh, uh, receive that merit. The man said, no, no, I cannot do that. <laughs> if I go say to uh, her that uh, please give me some dana, she will <laughs> kick me out. You know, you came uh, asking for the food and uh, uh, citing a lame excuse. Um, then the Pita said, uh, no, you, you said, uh, you tell her there is a place where I, I used to sit most of the time, the chair. So underneath the chair, you, you, you find uh, some treasure. 
hidden by me. <laughs> so you don't worry about that. Um, so he, she will be very happy actually because she can find some money uh, over there. So the monk went there out of compassion for her and said to her, and same thing happened here. Yes, so she refused. And then when he uh, explained about the hidden treasure, then the, the, the girl was, uh, the daughter was very happy and then she took uh, that money and she was surprised and then the monk said yes that was your mother and uh, uh, please uh, offer a dana and we can transfer merit to her and that way uh, the monk uh, and the young lady uh, have that uh, pity to come out of that suffering so many cases are there uh, they are not happy they are all stressful they are all um, depressed. They are um, finding a way uh, out of that uh, infinite suffering. So sometimes uh, we don't we don't think of these things when we are humans and we have so much of uh, many opportunities to do good, and um, so uh, we keep doing uh, due to our own ignorance, due to our own ego, or whatever. And we do all the wrong things in the world. And eventually we have to suffer. And by the time it is too late and no one will be there to help us. In the case of King Bimbisara's uh, relatives, uh, you see how they have been suffering so much uh, in the sansara because of their own bad karma. And for many, many eons, they have been waiting for someone to transfer merit to uh, them and it was only when King Bimbisara came up and still, although he was a powerful king, still they, uh, he could not do anything. Uh, they could not be helped. And only when he uh, started uh, following the Buddha, they appeared to him in dream, um, you know, giving so many uh, dreadful scenes and then nightmares and then King uh, went to the Buddha the following day asking what happened, what was the reason. And then the Buddha said, they were your past relatives. They have been waiting for someone to transfer merit to them. So it's always good to transfer merit to them. They were waiting and waiting for someone to open the door of the heavens. And so King Bimbisara, uh, under the guidance of the Buddha, um, did some dana and transferred uh, merit to them for them to uh, help rescue. Yeah, so you ask, how do we deal with ghosts, snakes, and scorpions? Well, uh, transferring merit, as Bhante Sumita mentioned. Um, but most importantly, our, our main practice is through cultivating metta. And this is what the Buddha recommended. Uh, the greatest protection is metta. When your heart is full of metta, then um, other beings will not, they'll not have much interest in harming you. Uh, so it makes it, it much safer. Uh, to go through the world. Um, so next we have a question from Paul. Paul asks, are there any consistent Tudong monks that you're aware of in the US? No. Um, and in fact, it's extremely rare for someone to do continuous Tudong practice. Normally it's something that's done for short periods of time, um, occasionally. Uh, it's very rare for someone to um, do long tudong all the time. Uh, so uh, even in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha made a rule that we have to spend at least three months of every year living in one place. So during the Vasa season. So the most that someone could do would be nine months out of every year. Uh, but even that is extremely rare. Um, in Thailand, I've heard of a couple of monks who do that, but it's not common. It's very, very rare. Um, but it is relatively common for people to do wandering practice for a week or two weeks or a month uh, or sometimes longer, um, maybe once a year, uh, maybe twice a year, uh, but very rarely more often than that. So in the U.S., I know of, of many monks who have done periods of, of Tudong in the U.S., uh, anywhere from a, a few weeks to a few months. Um, but I don't know of any who do it continuously anywhere in the world, whether in the US or otherwise. It's, 
It's not something that one does continuously. I don't know of any, do you? Yeah, I think monks who constantly wander in the US. I don't think the 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 most um, like popular monk that we heard here, uh Tam Sutam. <laughs> You know, yeah, I remember uh, he walked from uh, Los Angeles to New York for four months. Yeah, uh, that was really a tremendous um, walk, and he's uh, one of the the topmost that we heard that he came from Thailand. I think he walks everywhere just like that, and he actually has also inspired many uh, people here. And mm. yeah, he's some of the monks that we really have. Um, remember someone who walks a lot <laughs> he'll be joining us in italy yes yes <laughs> uh, so then bante varapanyo good to see you bante it's always lovely to see other monks joining in bante varapanyo asks uh, can either bante say anything about the rhinoceros sutra uh, Visana sutta my understanding is that this is early buddhist teachings and seems to really encourage very focused turong practice would you like to talk a bit about Kagga Visana Sutta? Yeah, I think uh, Eko Chare Kagga Visana Kapo is one of the popular uh, lines in that sutta, in uh, Sutta Nipata. Uh, yes, it's one of the uh, earliest uh, suttas uh, in the Tipitaka. Uh, very important to practice along, like how um, uh, uh, Kagga Visana means one drawn, uh, one horn rhino. Uh, when you are alone, you have to be self-sufficient, you have to be stronger. And a rhino has such a strong skin and also a very strong body and he can survive even by the attack of 10 lions. Rhino is very strong. So if you want to uh, wander alone, if you want to be alone, you have to be strong. You have to be self-sufficient and you have to be confident. So this thing uh, can happen only when you're confident. So the monks who are practicing in the jungle, in the forest, it's not easy. It will be so scary uh, for anyone without uh, much practice. So they need to be really confident in their practice, in their sila. And uh, yeah, that is very important. And also like uh, lifestyle uh, and also their, especially their um, havana, their meditation uh, and their um, Sila, they should be very concerned about that. And Kadavisana Sutta also um, gives some more hints about the Pacheka Buddha's uh, lifestyle. Um, they, uh, there are many, many beautiful uh, stanzas in the entire Sutta. I don't remember the whole thing, but Eko uh, Chare Kadavisana Sutta, you travel, you walk, you wander like a one-horned rhino uh, is something that the Buddha um, asks us to practice. You have to cultivate yourself so that you can practice uh, even alone, anywhere, uh, without any fear, without any doubt. Um, these are remarkable um, attributes of a wandering monk. Imagine like we walk and um, through the, the jungle, through the desert, and so many scary things can happen to you. And um, it's not easy. Um, there can be so many threats to you, uh, physically and mentally. And uh, so you have to um, be prepared for that, uh, especially mentally and also physically. Um, just like the rhino, uh, who is very strong, uh, both uh, physically and mentally. He survives alone, independent. And that is something uh, that we can learn more from this sutta. Okay. And uh, Bhavani has an off topic question, which would be good for monk chat. Uh, but that's the last of the questions on the topic, the wandering practice topic. Um, any questions from the monastery residents? No? Okay, so maybe we can go ahead and, and end the evening session at this time. Uh, so please do join in tomorrow. So as usual, tomorrow morning we'll have sutta study and tomorrow evening is our weekly monk chat. So you can bring all of your off topic questions for that. Uh, and again, if you'd like to join for 
any part of our uh, Dhamma wandering in Italy, uh, you can check out the itinerary online and uh, or send us an email for more information. You're welcome to come and join. So we'll end it this time with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we'll see you next time.